there. Um, uh, I'm Justin Ratcliffe, work at Fidelity Investments. Uh, this is Alessandro Pilotti, Club Based Solutions. And we are talking about VDI on OpenStack today. Um, I, I wanted to kind of start it off, kind of kick it off with why would you even think about doing that? Uh, oftentimes, OpenStack gets kind of pigeoned in the classical IaaS model. It's for hosted applications, scale applications, 12 factor, you know the buzzwords. Um, and VDI, though, is in many enterprises. It's in many places that we work today. And it, it's kind of just hanging out there. It eats up a lot of capacity. It costs a lot of money. Uh, it's primarily a Windows ecosystem. It has two primary vendors. You know their names. Um, it can often be aligned with big proprietary expensive stacks. And it's heavily used, again, in areas where there's some data sensitivity, that maybe the applications are a little older, a little more mature, as some might say. Um, but it's billions of dollars worth of spend goes into, into doing that work. Um, essentially, what is a VDI? A lot of people think desktop, so therefore it, it's not something we can do in a stack today. It's just another workload. And it has characteristics. We have stateful machines. We have stateless or ephemeral machines. We do capacity management can be a little bit more complex because it's a highly varied workload. Uh, and when we say like that, it, sometimes people are browsing CNN and driving huge CPU cycles. And sometimes they're using Microsoft Word and almost doing nothing. So how do you manage that capacity and what do you do to have to allocate capacity to meet those spikes. One area that is always a little bit painful is that the service quality is always aligned to the resources that are assigned to the instances. And that can be a problem. Um, I can't give you multiple instances and make you more productive. Much as if I gave you four or five or seven laptops, you're not going to be more productive. You're not going to run an application on each. And we have to always be focused on, on the fact that there are things outside of the infrastructure that are going to drive the user experience. And we commonly call that a connectivity protocol. So why would we consider using a private cloud, or even a public cloud, but a private cloud for VDI? So one, increased utilization. Uh, most often, uh, we have shift workers. You'll have your spike in the morning, you'll have your spike in the evening, and then most of the time it just kind of sits around. Maybe you get some patches. That's a huge opportunity. That's capacity that could be better used someplace else. We can offer better service diversity. In OpenStack, that might be flavors. It might be different backends that you're going to provide. And then you could correlate that with pricing. Elasticity, this is for me one of the most important ones. Rather than having essentially to, to capacitize for that 95th percentile, can I burst into capacity? Can I take advantage of uh, some just kind of white space that gets better utilized for test and dev or something in the event of disaster? Um, and then also getting the teams to prioritize delivering value instead, instead of that capacity. Too often, they're, they're chasing the infrastructure, the ops teams, the DevOps teams, the SREs. They're just trying to make sure that they have enough capacity to meet the needs. And that can often kind of, again, they're just chasing it rather than responding to their customer demand and listening to what the needs are for the, the rest of the business. Thanks, Justin. So why OpenStack for VDI? Well, let's start with a couple of questions. How many of you guys are already running some VDI solutions of some sort? Okay, up your hands. Very well. Perfect. Um, how many of you guys are running uh, Windows instances for your VDI? OK, cool. So the main problem with uh, traditional VDI is the fact that the solutions out there, let's say the market leader, uh, the, the, the Citrix, the, the Horizon View, the the markets of their DS and so on, uh, they don't have a real infrastructure as a service framework behind the scenes, okay? They're all built typically on top of some virtualization solutions, okay? Um, and that doesn't necessarily scale as well as OpenStack, and it doesn't necessarily 
offer the type of software defined everything that we get so accustomed to using OpenStack nowadays, no? So why should we use OpenStack? Well, the first question, well, the first <laughs> answer is this one. So um, OpenStack will offer you a full infrastructure service solution, right? The second thing is that it offers a standard REST API. So it doesn't really matter who built your OpenStack cloud. You could have done it yourself. You could have done it to any of the big vendors around here. Or, or you could have hired a consultant to do it for you. Okay? It doesn't really matter. In the end of the day, you're getting an OpenStack. And in order to be called OpenStack, it has to have a given set of APIs to work. Okay? So you basically zeroed at a point the vendor lock-in that you might have uh, by using one of the, let's say, regular enterprise um, infrastructure solutions okay, for, for, uh, for computing, for virtualization. Next, you have improved scalability on primary and in public cloud. So if you run only a, a, a few dozen servers, okay, it doesn't really matter. Okay? You can you just uh, plug directly into your VMware, your Hyper-V, your SAN desktop, whatever else. Okay? So you send server. But if you, if you need to scale, if you need to run thousands of VDI instances, then you need to have a full infrastructure or service solution behind you. Okay? So the scalability that comes with OpenStack in the private cloud is something that really doesn't, I mean, it, you cannot really replicate it with many other alternatives out there. And then there is a, the, 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 the series of options that you can have. No? So with OpenStack, you choose the hypervisors that you want. For example, you can use Hyper-V, which has remote effects, so it will be a perfect choice for running Windows workloads on top of, uh, um, um, of your um, OpenStack compute nodes. Or you can use KVM, because it's the de facto standard for many people in OpenStack. Or you can use VMware, or you can use Send Desktop, or whatever you want. Okay? And same things apply for storage. You can use Ceph, you can use uh, um, whatever, iSCSI or Fiber Channel or whatever solution, okay? You can use scale out for server on Windows Server, whatever else, no? And same thing for the networking. You can have uh, OpenV switch, you can have uh, your preferred um, SDN solution, you can have a proprietary one, doesn't really matter, okay? So OpenStack, it's all about choice. And the main idea here is to be able to put your um, VDI solution on top of a common infrastructure as a service layer, okay? Um, when we talk about VDI, yeah, some of you might, of course, run uh, Linux desktops in, uh, in, uh, in, in the context of a VDI framework, okay? But it's very uncommon as a choice because a Linux desktop itself is not so common as a choice, okay? Uh, you might run uh, Mac OS. But macOS has a series of limitations of where you can run it, right? So it never became particularly popular from that perspective. So at the end of the day, Windows is what most of the people use, okay? Just as an idea, how many of you run Linux as a VDI desktop? Okay. A few hands, actually. I'm quite happy to see that. Um, so for all the rest, it's Windows, right? Um, when we started our involvement, we as cloud-based, of course, in, in, in OpenStack, our mission was always to make sure that Windows was a first-class citizen in the OpenStack world, okay? Many people think that uh, OpenStack is a Linux-only thing. That's absolutely not true. OpenStack is an absolutely platform-independent uh, solution, okay, or project, or set of projects. Um, we proved that by running the entire stack, of course, on Windows and Hyper-V. But we are also particularly concerned to make sure that Windows runs perfectly fine in any OpenStack compute node, regardless of what you're running. Could be KVM, could be Hyper-V, could be VMware, whatever else, okay? Um, so the provisioning part is performed by cloud-based init. How many of you are using cloud-based init? Okay, cool, very cool. Um, so cloud-based init is the de facto standard for provisioning uh, Windows instances in OpenStack, right? So it's a, a real pity if you're running uh, Windows instances or in general any operating system in OpenStack without having also um, a provisioning agent, okay? Think about cloud init for Linux and cloud-based init for Windows. So first it supports every possible Windows version, Windows 7, 8, 8, 1, 10 on the guest, and also Windows Server 2012, 2012 for 2, and 2016. It works also on XP on 2003, but as you all well know, those are not supported by Microsoft anymore. 
It supports hit templates and user data scripts, which can perform any type of customization. So if you're running VDI, most probably you will want to join your, your desktops in an Active Directory domain. You might want to apply some group policies. You might want to apply per user applications, configurations, whatever else, okay? So cloud-based init allows you to run whatever you want, okay? Of course, as part of uh, um, hit templates, as part of user data, or whatever. Um, especially in terms of PowerShell scripts that you can run, meaning that you can automate everything. Um, you can download it, of course, our site. It's uh, on GitHub uh, OpenStack, so it's fully open source. Um, and um, the lifecycle of cloud based needs is, of course, uh, handled by Garrett like every other OpenStack project. It's also, it has its own continuous integration framework and so on, okay? Um, available on any OpenStack hypervisor, so Hyper-V, ASXI, KVM. Uh, it's a provisioning agent, user data execution, and we recorded more than 8 million runs of cloud based init in one year, it's like less than one year and a half, okay? So when people say that Windows is not a big thing in, uh, in OpenStack, well, those numbers tell me something completely different, okay? So 8 million instances in this amount of time, it's quite a number. If you want Microsoft support for your Windows instances in OpenStack, so if it's running on Hyper-V, the support comes out of the box, okay? Since in Hyper-V we are using only uh, documented APIs, it means that you're already fully supported by Microsoft. If you're running on KVM, you need to be your stack to be part of the SVVB platform. So check with your vendor if you have this capability. This means that you cannot just take the uh, virtual your drivers that come from the community, and exp even if they work, you won't have Microsoft support. You need to have actually the certified ones from uh, Red Hat, Canonical, SUSE, and so on, okay? VDI options for OpenStack. Let's now get a little bit more into, into, the, into the core, into the interesting part of things. Um, our main idea is to keep OpenStack as the common layer beneath and putting on top whatever um, VDI solution you prefer to, to have, okay? We will focus on uh, two, let's say, commercial ones, uh, which is the Microsoft uh, Remote Desktop Services and uh, Citrix and Desktop um, that Justin will then go on and demo. And then we will introduce also a fully open source one, okay? So we got a lot of um, uh, um, users coming and asking for a fully open source uh, uh, VDI solution. So we say, hey, why, should, why don't we just build one, you know? Why do we uh, eliminate all the vendor lock-in at every possible level except VDI? I think it's time also to get rid of vendor lock-in even there. Um, I will introduce briefly the Microsoft RDS plus OpenStack idea. So let's uh, go on with the questions to the crowd. So how many of you are using the Microsoft RDS VDI? Okay, a few of you guys. Cool. Um, this is the Microsoft solution. So if you're running a purely native Microsoft uh, uh, stack, to say so, which let's say all the, all the bits and pieces in your stacks are coming from Microsoft, this is most probably what you're using. It has a web portal. Um, that allows you to have, uh, well, first an interface where you log in with your credentials and then you can choose what type of desktops or applications to, to access, okay? And it allows you to do RDP over HTTP. Now, RDP is the protocol that you use for remote desktop, okay? Um, it has a connection broker which assigns a desktop to a user request. And the connection broker offers a plugin model so that any third party can write a plugin. So as you can imagine, we wrote a plugin for OpenStack. Uh, now a plugin uses Keystone, Nova, Neutron, Glance, Cinder APIs, and so on, okay? So I wanted to show you briefly the architecture of this thing. So you can have the gateway, you have the RD web, which is the web portal. Uh, behind it, you have the connection broker, and inside of the connection broker, you have the OpenStack plugin, okay? This plugin will basically receive requests from, uh, uh, from the connection broker, like, hey, I have a new user, get me a desktop for this user. Then the plugin is simply fetching one available um, instance in Nova out of a pool, assign it to that user, and from that moment on, that user will always be tied to that specific instance until the user decides, of course, to terminate it, okay? You have also different models. 
So this is the persistent one. And you can also have a pooled one in which basically you might have, for example, help desk users that in the moment in which we log off, that specific desktop becomes available for somebody else, okay? So in that case, you're simply having a pool of machines that get assigned to whatever users wants it. But the logic for that is instead of that, inside of that OpenStack plugin, which behind the scenes is talking to Nova, and um, which in turn will talk to KVM, to Hyper-V, and so on, okay? If you want to have remote effects, easy. Just use Hyper-V, and the glance image will know, will, will actually tell Nova to use remote effects, okay? Uh, wait, one slide before. The pros of this solution is it's a very familiar user experience for Microsoft customers. It supports traditional shared RDS as well. You know, the old school remote desktop services is also available. And we can also handle it via the OpenStack if needed. You can have Active Directory single sign on. On the outside, the default portal is honestly horrible. <laughs> it's very old school. <laughs> so you need most probably to develop your own to, to improve on top of that. And it requires ActiveX. Okay, this feels very, very 1995, <laughs> but it requires ActiveX if you want to, if to add to have a direct single sign-on, meaning that inside of your browser, you will have directly the session, but I mean, that's definitely not working on top of a Mac or on top of different browser, compared, which, is not, which are not, let's say, Internet Explorer. How many of you are using Internet Explorer? Kidding. <laughs> I hope nobody. <laughs> okay. Um, what else? It has a PowerShell support for managing all your pools, but uh, um, um, they say it doesn't work too well with third-party plugins and pools, okay? It works, but it's still not, let's say, a des designed, let's say, to work directly with that, okay? Um, okay, I think we can move on with Citrix. Cool. He's one of the few people outside of Redmond that can still write COM ATL code, which is what you would require to actually do this work, which I think is the most amazing part of that entire thing. Um, again, it, some people might think that if you're going to use OpenStack as an IaaS, it's an all or nothing kind of thing. You, you need to go open source. You need to go cloud native. Um, that's not, just not true. Um, many folks use Citrix. Um, and unlike VMware, VMware vertical stack, highly integrated, not necessarily open to other things, Citrix does have some options to be able to integrate alternative solutions. Um, Citrix historically, like way back when, was one of the primary members of the OpenStack Foundation. Now they went off and kind of did their own thing for a little bit, and there's a lot of history there. Um, but. It, as they've kind of come back, it's, it's starting to look at, okay, well, what can we do here? Now, they don't have an OpenStack provider today. They go, and you know the list inside Zen Desktop Studio. Um, they have options. Um, and all of those things are backed by a hypervisor compatibility library. Um, if you are a Citrix-ready partner, which I'm technically not, but I have a lot of friends, um, you can actually get access to the provisioning SDK. And there are th those who are actually downstairs who have gotten access and made integration libraries. And you can stage those things within Zen Desktop. And while not perfect, um, it'll allow Zen Desktop to talk to the IaaS of your choice. And in this case, we're going to do a, I'm going to cross the fingers and do a little demo. Um, I'm going to talk to OpenStack. And in OpenStack, I'm not necessarily just going to say, well, it's the classical KVM style on Ceph, or yada, yada, yada. Uh, in this case, in the, the lab I'm connecting into actually has an availability zone for KVM and an availability zone for Hyper-V. Um, it's something that I could choose by just uh, adding a little bit of PowerShell stuff. Uh, what you will see is that it's not in studio. Um, Let's say Studio, being a, a classic, a more mature technology, has a little flexibility problem. Um, Citrix is working on that, and the team is taking a look at those things. But for the time being, much of what Citrix is is backed by PowerShell. So I can use a little bit of PowerShell to put stuff where it needs to be, to set it up, and to get it going. Another challenge also when it comes down to this is debugging, and it feels a little unnatural. Doing unit testing is what you want to do, but in this case, I have to be looking at event tracing for Windows or in Citrix parlance, Citrix diagnostic facility, um, or framework, 
um, and taking a look at all the data that's coming out of Zen Desktop and just kind of filtering off the stuff that I care about. Um, now it's not ready yet because like any good regulated company, I have a little bit of bureaucracy to deal with, but the intent is that I'm going to actually put this up in our open source repo, uh, which is FMR LLC at GitHub. Um, and so that, that goal's there. I just have a few more hurdles I was not able to get over uh, before making it happen. Um, so again, there's some code, there's some PowerShell, and when it's all said and done, it will show up in studio. You just won't be able to kind of manage the connections or manage the hosting units or, or some of the kind of more fundamental stuff. Um, and again, I did write code in the past, but let's say uh, a little crusty. Um, so that's a call out to a local guy who happens to write a couple comics. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not going to bore, bore you guys with that. Um, this is the flow. If you don't know what machine creation services is, which is essentially what's, what's doing this work, not the provisioning services stuff, but this is what's going on in the background. This is what essentially the PowerShell is going to orchestrate. And um, uh, again, it's just a, a series of commandlets. Um, there's a couple links in there um, to find out some more data. Other folks have gone in and figured this stuff out. Um, so it's not magic. Not well documented, but not magic. And then again, this is just a high level look at it. It's just, it can talk to any OpenStack regardless of curator, distribution, fill in the blank, you're pulling right off of root, it does not matter. Um, you're just going to be able to load a DLL on your delivery controllers, call essentially an exe, register plugins, and what will happen is it'll become coherent to Zen Desktop. And at that point, PowerShell, the PowerShell commandlets that are within Citrix's SDK will actually function and you can actually go in and do stuff. Demo time? Demo time. All right. Can we switch over to number two? So this is the code, for sake for a better term. It's not a whole lot. This is essentially one. Most of the stuff I've isolated here. Um, and it's pretty minimal. Um, I'm actually using a project. Um, from Rackspace, OpenStack.net. If you go to the OpenStack SDKs, you'll see call out for .NET. It's not alien technology. Um, and well, uh, it needs some love, it needs some, some time to be invested in it. It works. It allows me to create VMs, update VMs, manage attachments. I did find some gaps, so I, I did actually have to do a couple little web client calls uh, to, to put stuff here. Um, but it's functional and it's managed code. So essentially Citrix being a very heavily .NET opinionated shop, it functions. And then the fun stuff. Um, so I'm going to pray, pray to the demo gods and see if this thing works right. So I'm going to pull up here and you can see the little start flashing through is CDF monitor. So CDF monitor, again, it's event tracing for Windows. Um, don't think you're going to be able to read that. It's going by, it's basically any event that's going through the entire system. So it is going out there and essentially it's starting to, it's doing the full thing. It's registering the plugin, it's creating the connection, it's creating the hosting units, it's creating the catalogs, the provisioning schemes and everything. And then hopefully we'll see, oops, if I can type. Let's check out instances here. And you can see it's actually already created the instance. <laughs> so one of the things that's unique to machine creation services is this concept of identity disk. So cloud-based init does a lot of this, this similar work. But to try to stay, let's say, pure with Citrix, I followed what machine identity services. It was previously part of the Ardens project. Um, and is what is used in provisioning services. So I create the 16 megabyte identity disk that contains one file, a 700 byte file, and then plop it into a cinder volume that is one gigabyte. 
incredibly inefficient. Uh, but it is essentially what it happens. It doesn't matter if you look, use Zen Desktop on Azure or on AWS, they all use the same framework. Uh, there's some opportunity there to improve it. One thing is, and I won't be able to demo this because I wasn't able to fix it, uh, Creators Update seems to have introduced something that is preventing MIS from actually working. But um, everything should be hanging out there. So if I go here, I can see an identity disk that's been attached. And if I were to go back here to my hosting, come on. Let's try to refresh it. Let me cross your fingers. So connection and hosting units. Anybody who's seen Citrix knows what this thing looks like. It, it looks and feels like anything else. So all your Zen Desktop admins that are out there could consume these uh, today. I put a machine in here. I got one machine there. I got a delivery group hanging out over here. Sadly, the machine is unregistered because uh, Zen Desktop does depend on Kerberos, so it needs that identity work to actually work. So we see that we have one, one unregistered machine. But that was all just done, and it's, it's coherent to the system. So if I were to actually go off script, because I don't have to worry about the, redoing this demo, um, I can actually delete it, hopefully. see if it, if it actually goes. If it doesn't, then it's not a big deal. Um, and it'll actually clean it up, because the basic functionality is already kind of tied into that system. So again, you can complement OpenStack as an IaaS with things that are, you may have today. And that's going to reduce the, the barriers for your, for your teams, for your DevOps and admin teams, to be able to consume the solutions that they have and, with the knowledge they have. But that may not be enough. You may want to do something a little bit different. You may want to see, can you go open source? Can you do something that's more cloud native, because no one's going to say Citrix is cloud native, um, and, and offer a service that takes over a part of your environment? Maybe even all. And that's next. So back to number one. Let's retry. Siri, switch desktop. I didn't no. use the keyword. It must be my accent. Uh, OK. There it goes. <laughs> Thank you. So open source VDI. So we are introducing here for the first time publicly a project that we recently started and uh, we believe has a lot of potential in this space. Um, so to begin with, the goal is to have a fully open source alternative, OK, top to bottom. So the entire stack has to be open source, OK, except the Windows machines, of course. So we'll start with a web front end, which will be HTML5. Behind it, we, we, we need something which is translating, um, let's say, the RDP protocol into something that can be displayed into the HTML5 canvas, OK? We have two candidates there. One is called Guacamole. It's a very nice project, which currently is under the Apache Foundation. And then there is another project, which is FreeRDP Web Connect, OK? So we are planning, most probably, to support both of them. This demo now will use Guacamole. Both of them, behind the scenes, are using FreeRDP. FreeRDP is an open source Apache 2 implementation of the RDP protocol, OK? Um, the good thing is that Microsoft uh, uh, published the specs of the RDP protocol. So uh, of everything that we do today with RDP protocol is based on those specs. So it's not like all the um, RDP clients, like, like I think our desktop back in the days, that, that had to basically reverse engineer the protocol with a lot of you know, issues here and there, okay? Modern uh, open source RDP clients, like FreeRDP, are adhering to the specs, which are public, okay, which is great. Um, in browser HTML5 desktop sessions, meaning that your HTML5 will just go inside of the desktop. Then the next thing that we will have to add is RDP over HTTP. So you take the RDP protocol, it goes through the gateway, and from the gateway, goes out over HTTP. On the other side, you will have an, an, an RDP client, and that RDP client will connect to the gateway and behind the scenes across to your, to your machine, OK? So that's the next thing that we are, will uh, add. 
This will allow also to have uh, external native clients, so it will work exactly like, uh, like the Microsoft uh, Remote Desktop Services from this perspective, okay? So if you're familiar with the remote, uh, with the RDP client in Microsoft, that's exactly what you're talking about. So it works on, uh, on the Mac, it works on Windows, and it works, of course, on, on Linux. Uh, there are various clients for that as well. Uh, let's talk about, um, well, let's move to briefly to the architecture. As usually, you know, one picture helps a lot to, to get an idea. The architectural basic details are relatively simple. The main important thing is that uh, we want to decouple all the logic of all the individual components here in a way in which each component takes care of one specific area, okay? So they are fully decoupled from a software architectural perspective. Um, the web client is just in charge of displaying stuff and getting user input from the user. The GUAC-D is the guacamole demon, which is, as, was, as we were saying before, is translating from RDP into a web socket that goes to the uh, web client, okay? Um, GUAC-D has a, a, a plugin architecture to say so, so inside there we will have a, a, a communication, for example, with, uh, with Keystone that will allow us to, to make sure that you are authenticated in the moment in which you are requesting a given connection. Otherwise, everybody could actually go out and request it. Then there is another component, which is the VDI broker, which is brand new, okay? The VDI broker is a new project, open source, of course, written in Python and written like every other OpenStack project using, for example, Oslo Service, Oslo Messaging, and all the various uh, OpenStack common libraries. It's using Keystone, of course, for authentication, and it's written like an OpenStack project, okay? So the main idea here is that we will most probably contribute it also to the foundation if, if it gets, of course, enough traction. Um, Behind the scenes, of course, is talking to the, to the same keystone in the same environment. The VDI broker has an important goal, assigning requests from the user to get a desktop to an actual desktop. And there is not only one desktop. So for example, when the user logs in, the user might have a series of options. For example, he might get a development desktop, a help desk desktop, or whatever else. Now, because you might have different profiles, that will open different type of applications. And since the RDP protocol allows you also to control individual applications and not only entirely desktops, you might have uh, one icon from Excel, one from Word, and everything, okay? I'm superseding here <laughs> on the fact that it makes sense or not, but it's a very common way of handling VDI. So the broker will simply check the pool and check if there's an available desktop in the pool to assign to a user. Of course, if the user already received the desktop, we will make sure to get back to the return to that user that specific desktop, okay? If not, if it's a new one, we will fetch a new one. One thing that we want absolutely to avoid is that when the user comes in, we have to wait for, the, for Nova to boot an entire machine. That will generally kill the experience, right? So we want to make sure that at least in most cases, there will be a desktop ready and an assigned, able to be assigned to the user. What, did, what we did in this case is that when you create a pool inside of the configuration, there is a REST API for, um, for the VDI broker, you will tell it how many free machines you want to have in the pool, okay? You will have a, two, a maximum, a minimum, okay, and, and a preferred value. So this way, whenever you consume a machine, there will be a, a process in the background that will say, oh, I ended up uh, running short on the free machines available in the pool, I have to spin up a new one, okay? So let's say it's nine o'clock in the morning, everybody logs in, we have to make sure that we have a pool available in free instances that will be consumed very quickly, and so this process will make sure to instantiate new ones so that this pool will be always available, up to a max level. Because you might say, well, my infrastructure won't be able to sustain more than, let's say, 10,000, for example, instances, so at that point, we will return an error to the user, but uh, that, that will be, of course, a choice of the deployer to decide how many instances maximum this specific pool should be able to allocate. And since we are using Keystone, we will also be able who is able to access the pool and who is not. So based off your user profile and your identity in Keystone, you will have these permissions. Next. Before getting into the demo, uh, here is the current location of the project, okay, it's in, it's in very initial stages, okay? 
but we will planning to add more and more. If you guys plan to contribute or you know anybody that wants to contribute, we will be more than happy to have it. This is full open source, and we want it to become a cross-company effort, okay? So it's not only a cloud-based thing or a fidelity thing or anything else, right? Um, what else? Think that we are pretty close to the demo. Uh, open source VDI, so on the pros side, no vendor lock-in. No licensing cost. There is nobody that will tell you that any time that the user logs in, you have to pay them some money. Unless, of course, you have an agreement with a company that will tell you, yes, we will provide you support, we will provide you consulting and everything, and we decide to charge you on, uh, on that amount of money, okay? But if you want to do it yourself, it's open source. It can leverage remote effects on Hyper-V or anything else, because again, the choice on the infrastructure service behind, it's up to you. You can use Hyper-V, you can use KVM, you can use VMware, or whatever you want. On the negative side, on the cons, of course, it's lacking some of the advanced features that proprietary solutions offer. So let's not forget that VDI is a very established uh, market, right? So vendors in that area ended up inventing new features every time to be able to outsell the competition, no? But at the end of the day, in our experience, when we asked around, the majority of the users just wants a simple solution in which you have a portal and the user can just click on its desktop, open a desktop, and use it, okay? Then, of course, there is much more than that, app layering or whatever else, uh, um, various type of profiles and so on, that we can also add um, as the project, of course, uh, gets more and more mature, also on the open source side. Okay, demo time. that we can forgot that I was using a PowerPoint was directly here okay here is the portal It's currently very basic in the in the UI so don't expect anything fancy here so I'm just logging in um, I logged in with my user okay which of course means that I talked to Keystone Keystone get, got me a token and I passed the token to the VDI broker and I asked the VDI broker hey broker what pools do I have and the broker said well you have a pool called the help desk desktop and one pool called development desktop and then um, if I look into currently into my instances here I can see in uh, in uh, in horizon or if I do an nova list that there are four of them actually five because one we already created it uh, those ones are simply the, uh, the machines which are uh, waiting in the pool to be instantiated, okay? So now I'm just clicking here. The first click means that I allocated the instance, okay? The second click will get me directly to my desktop. So this is guacamole behind. The instance is coming, so it takes a little bit of time because I'm actually logging in into it, okay? So this is actually the, the web interface uh, going to GuacD. GuacD is seeing that I am authenticated and I can actually access this desktop. Then coming back, asking Nova, hey, where should I go? Nova telling him, here is your endpoint, which is basically a floating IP which got created on the fly for you, and, and, uh, and, and a security group which allows port 3389, of course, for RDP, and then reporting it back, okay? What version of Windows you run is irrelevant, okay? Then, just for the sake of the demo, I have another one which is called uh, Development Desktop that I can, I can log in. And I have a separate session with another version of Windows. Since it's development, in this case we used that decided to put in a Windows Server Core, okay? But it doesn't really matter. The important thing is to show that we are able to, uh, to, to have a solution which is fully software defined, okay? And allows the user to enter in a simple portal and get a desktop out of the blue, and having, of course, OpenStack behind the scenes creating and doing all the work for you. So if I refresh here, I will see that I have, of course, more instances behind. Admin or demo? Of course, I lost my session while, while doing the, the session. Okay, look, here we go. And we can see that there is, a, uh, you can see the two top here, time seems created uh, zero minutes and one minute, okay? And uh, this means that we got, one of the others got assigned to us, 
and the pool ended up under the minimum size, so the broker automatically instantiated the extra ones, okay? So this is everything we need for a lot of customer scenarios. Of course, the project is young. We need to add stuff on top of it. But you can see that we had single sign-on. We had everything that we needed to be able to deliver desktops to our, to our users. OK, that was it for the demo. I think we're also almost running out of time. I think we're only on the thank you slide. OK, we are at the thank yeah. you slide. <laughs> so again, we throw up a couple of resources here. Uh, but thanks for coming. I know sometimes VDI can, it, it doesn't seem like a session you're going to find here at the summit, but it is a reality for many of our companies and for many partners uh, and many service providers. And I think there is interest. There's desire to try to make this better and to make it a workload that actually works for OpenStack. Thanks. Any? Okay. Thank you.